Um, I want to remind everyone that this is the second to last art lecture this year. We have one more next week um, with Mihant Christ, who's a writer in residence um, and the biological sciences um, at Columbia University. So a writer is coming next Wednesday. And that'll be the last art lecture. We were going to try for a pachakacha, but um, I put sort of cast the hook out and it didn't, no nibbles. So I'm waiting for more enthusiasm for future seniors. So next year, if you're going to be in school and graduating next year and you know people from various fields of study who also will be doing final sort of thesis work and you want to come and have an interdisciplinary um, presentation that's rapid fire and interesting, let, think about organizing that for next year and I'm happy to host it. Um, today we have Don Cerny and uh, April Davidson will be introducing Don. So let's give the mic to April. Hi, my name is April Davidson. I'm a junior in the art slash work program here at Evergreen. On our visiting artist website, you will find images of her work in painting and drawing on paper, as well as sculptures in a variety of materials, including but not limited to wood, foam, resin, and plaster tape. Currently, her work can be viewed at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, where she has collaborated with the artist slash architect team called Craft Dunce on a commissioned project called Fun, Period, No Fun. The work is an installation meant to investigate, and this is a quote from the Henry's website, how space and memory mediate experience, just as desire and lived experience affect the spaces we build, imagine, and occupy. In 2015, she was nominated for the Stranger Genius Award in Visual Art, in which the singular regional publication aims to shine the light of media attention on the artists who are doing revolutionary things in their studios. She studied at Cornish College of the Arts and then went on to receive her MFA in Sculpture at Bard College. She is currently on the Art Department faculty at Seattle University and Talking with the artist beforehand, she wants us to know that she has very bad boundaries and a significant sugar addiction. <laughs> Please welcome Don Cerny. So, so nice to be here. It's true, I wanted to get that out of the way about my bad boundaries. You can take it as an invitation. But please, please don't, I'm learning learning how to set boundaries, except when it comes to sugar. So hello. Um, I, there's so many ways to begin this talk, and I'm horrible, because everything to me is this kind of like tangential, oh, and then there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this, as though I'm the most fascinating person around, and you don't have your own thoughts. Um, so I'm gonna begin by saying my, um, my kind of touchstone is this idea of the arcade, right? So this, this precursor to what we understand as the mall, uh, a physical place, an architectural place of beauty, wherein set inside there are shops offering different possibilities, right? So, so you, Walter Benjamin, Benjamin, it's like chipotle, chipotle. I, I'm so sarcastic now that I can't remember what's correct. Uh, <laughs> um, wrote this amazing text called The Arcade Projects, which has also been a really important touchstone. Um, wherein, to, <laughs> to give a, a short description, it's a, a kind of encyclopedia of belonging, right, in my mind. Uh, a way for him to track all the things that he belongs to and then put it into some sort of organized sense, right? So you're getting to travel along this, this, this other person's relationship with what they belong to. So this idea of belonging and connection and these little tiny stores that you come into and are kind of possibilities at one point of your life, right? Um, the way Spencer's gifts, right, for some of us might have been like a, a, a huge possibility at one point of our lives, but then we grow up and then we, we have different problems and we're informed by different things, so other shops are interesting, right? Um, 
this this idea of people, movement, and object in the relation of these of these things um, all playing out within this field uh, is very important to me. And this idea of choice, right? That we choose, we and in choosing, there's this relationship of belonging. When we when we find something, right, that we we are attracted to or like, there's this thread somehow of belonging. And kind of unpacking that belonging and really looking at, you know, the ways that kind of biased and historical positions and, you know, um, your, your uh, epigenetic patterns of behavior in your family inform how we think about belonging is also very, very important to me. So you can understand, <laughs> I have a boundary issue, right? So in this, in this way, I'm really interested in, in everything and this kind of encyclopedic quality of everything. But to get back to the arcade, there's something about an architectural space that's dictating possibility that's very fascinating to me, which ironically, I understand is just the internet, right? <laughs> okay, so, but because I'm thinking always of history and understanding these patterns of history, um, at, in 2000, I decided that for, um, I was, in my senior year at Cornish, I decided that part of my studio practice would be getting a job at Restoration Hardware, um, which at the time is this retail store that would reproduce historical objects like Biedermeier side tables or little toys, or they would go out and kind of like find things in curiosity shops and then reproduce them over and over again. And then at that time, they would have these framed stories, these narratives that went along with them. And I was really, I, I had studied printmaking and painting, and I was really interested in this idea of the, the, this idea of the multiple and, and what happens in repetition, right? How, how meaning is, is made or manipulated within this idea of repetition, and especially when it came to repetition in relation to these narratives that were being constructed, it was also, also kind of like creating this very seductive manipulation of belonging for a very specific kind of person who didn't have the time or wherewithal or the, the gumption to go through like flea markets and junk stores and estate sales to find things. They wanted things that didn't have the kind of stench of death, right? <laughs> but they wanted the, 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 the relationship to like history, right? Or the romance or the almost like this kind of idea of authenticity, right? It's like buying authenticity, but it's a authenticity that's been mass produced. This idea was very, very fascinating to me, um, but it was also a job in retail, right? So I'm also getting to kind of like Oh, do you want these doorknobs? Are these going to make you happy, right? Like trying to use it as a way where I was making money for rent, but I'm also really looking at about people performing their desire, right? And what they're attracted to and what they're, how the, the, the display of the store is kind of orienting at that point, this kind of like otherworldly quality that people were, um, were almost like scientifically constructing these kind of stage sets to inspire or evoke a possibility or an aspiration. <laughs> Do you like that transition? <laughs> Magic. Um, and this leads me to, and then I jump, right? Nine years later, um, I have, right, I have many shows. It was important to me as an artist to not go right in to get my master's because like, pff, that's just a lot of money and maybe like, I don't wanna say jerk off fest because I'm being uh, recorded, but maybe, right? Uh, <laughs> so it was important to me to, to give myself some space and time to know how to fail as an artist and to know how to make community and to really understand who I was, right, as an artist, so that the possibility of graduate school was more like this act of like ripping myself apart from what I had built 
so that I knew that I could build it again if it was all taken away from me. So I'm not showing any of that work, not because it's not interesting, it's great, it's interesting work. But this, this idea for me, at least of, of going to graduate school and throwing everything that I had worked so hard for nine years to build up just to see what was there. So for, in the, that nine years, it was predominantly printmaking, these kind of installations. They were always dealing with space, but always in this kind of speculative manner. So I would work on paper, cut things out, put things places. They were like slightly literary, very research oriented, but I was never, I was always kind of skirting this idea of like actual concrete thing, right? It was, it was always this kind of, um, this avoidance really of architecture, even though I was always talking about architecture in place. So sneakily, right? I, I still can't deal with architecture, <laughs> but I can deal with these moments that are in between architecture, um, like the mantle, right? So after graduate school, I'm like, I go for sculpture. I had never done sculpture before. I knew it had something to do with sculpture and form and something about the, the, the kind of narrative possibility of the body to thing and how we read something and really confronting, I don't know, like this, this annoyance I had at sculpture too, because it's always, I love painting, so it's always the thing that's in the way of painting. And so my, <laughs> my tendency is that if something seems like a bad idea, then I'm definitely going to do it, right? Because, because like, what's the point of just being good at what you're doing, right? I'm not going to learn anything interesting about like what I don't know if I just continually do things that I do. Again, I would show you those sculptures, but we don't have time. They're not good. Uh, <laughs> they still not, may not be good. But there's, so there's something, right, that I've come from restoration hardware, like done all this stuff, thinking a lot about literature, thinking about narrative, thinking about form and space and the body. And then I come upon this image of Walker Evans right, the table, fireplace, these pictures, right, that these sharecroppers have put in their home. For me, this was like this radical thing because it was the first time I had recognized that through the arrangement, the choosing and arrangement of objects, there was like an act of radical liberty. That through beauty, right, through the choosing of things that you delight in, and the arrangement for your own pleasure that no matter what your socioeconomic position, there was power in it. And that, of course, was like this, this moving thing because now suddenly this pejorative way that I heard the domestic always talked about in graduate school, right? This was always this thing that, oh, it's very domestic. And every time I heard that in a room, I'd go like, Ugh, like, like as though I felt sorry for the person that was doing the thing that was domestic because of the work of women, right? Oh, who cares? Um, the work of the home uh, is, is, is seen largely as unrigorous, right? And that is, for me, really problematic for so many different reasons. Um, but I began to really understand that my own fear in talking about the home and domestic and family, right, became, again, like a really bad idea that I felt kind of compelled to move into. Because, well, what, what is that? Why is it a bad idea? Um, there, there's so many reasons why, right? It's like sentimental, it's kitschy, it's unrigorous. Um, it's a privilege to be at home. It's a privilege to have a home, right? Like, why, why do we want to look at that? So, so I'm like, well, I don't know. Well, I'm just going to keep looking. And so I started doing these, these kind of research experiments with just looking at, like, looking at home and display all over, which is great because a lot of, there's a lot of homes and there's a lot of depictions of homes everywhere. And I started thinking a lot about this, the speed of display and the speed of presentation, right? So things that are quick and things that are highly rigorous. And the ways that these, these two modes, just from a sculpture point of view, right, are kind of depicting 
sensations, right? That we have sensations of like, <laughs> like, oh, this is where I want to belong, but this is who I really am, right? Or, <laughs> and so I started, I started kind of making these, for me, sketches, but they're kind of these sculptural wall pieces that were quoting a lot of the findings that I had about the things that denoted domestic decoration and ornamentation, and was trying to to, to really just understand spatially, right, what they were doing. So I was doing a lot of kind of quoting of the vase as a, uh, a quoting of antiquity, which is a quoting of like taste, like very high taste, right? Um, and then these smaller sculptures that are in the center, right, we're speaking of the sense of scale too, because the thing about the 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 oh, I did it again. The domestic is that it's all kind of like in this this like known body dwelling scale. So there's something Herbert Reed wrote in his book, like the history of sculpture. Um, Herbert Reed's a pretty fascinating anarchist from the, the last turn of the century. It might be interesting to look into. He's kind of a crusty musty, but he writes this really great chapter in the. Um, in this like history of sculpture, where he's talking about the, the monument and the amulet. So the monument, right, being a kind of scale thing that's supposed to tell us something about ourselves, right? It's this kind of, again, aspirational mo like thing, right, about who we are, who we murdered, right, um, who paid for it. Uh, and then the amulet being this this thing that has a much more intimate, um, maybe religious, right? If we think about a relic or a reliquary, there's this kind of different kind of meaning. There's a different kind of psychic weight about what the amulet is, also in relation to the body. So, so I'm kind of thinking, as I'm doing these things, I'm becoming really aware of like my compulsion to this like, amulet, bougie, right, like clock size thing, always, as I'm making, it's like always in relation to the body, like the size of my head, right, the size of my hand, the size of my arm. So there's, there was continually like always this kind of obsession with figure, the figurative, right, and the narrative or the body in relation to these things as well. Um, and then these smaller things are almost like the maquette, right? These kind of like theatrical things that all had, that evoked these different sensations that as I moved them around, they became like toys, right? In different relationships to each other. So I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, additionally, I was interested in, in how, how I could evoke a kind of monument for myself that was like a, a soft monument. Um, it like as close, right? <laughs> like as close to monument as I could get, right? If, if monument is like deeply suspicious because the monument is like always predicated on this like idea in my mind of an in and an out, right? Like one person is in, which means everybody else is out or these people are in, which means it doesn't belong to everybody else. That, that I was trying to think of like what the monumental scale that I could deal with was, which is like not monumental at all. It's just the size of like a room. Um, but for me, right, I'm like, whoa, this is, this is really big because, so it's a silkscreen paper that has, you know, been printed over and over in these kind of module-like sheets so that I could move them around and kind of figure out what sculptural form, so almost like a theatrical relationship to the body, um, would, be, would be interesting. So I came up with this kind of strange, this strange, um, you know, it's like almost quoting this, uh, like a minimalist work, right? Except it has this hysteria going on. <laughs> and the hysteria going on, right? This, this idea of, the, of ornamentation or pattern um, as a way to, was very, very interesting to me, especially as a printmaker, especially with my, you know, ad, ad, admitting that I'm really interested in repetition. And what happens within repetition is that the, 
when you when you write repeat something over and over and over again, it, it's it's meaning changes and and in some cases becomes almost invisible. I mean, I don't know if any of you grew up in homes with pattern anywhere, but they're not when you're around them all the time, you really it, it just becomes like almost like a white noise. And I was really I was curious about kind of what what kind of anxiety or what kind of proposition could be you know, embedded into imagery that that could could kind of be unsettling or kind of not related to any specific narrative or history or, um, but just had this sense of like, something's going on, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and that's what this, this image was for me, um, that it has this kind of like, maybe John the Baptist, right? Maybe something religious. Um, repeated over and over again in in this form was somehow like a very a very exciting moment as well because right it meant that this thing paper could be used to evoke the sens sensations of something grand um, and also something really kind of like low or domestic or decorative right or the ornamentation that is like always seen with such suspicion. And I, I mean, I get it. I get why it's seen with such suspicion, but it don't, I don't know if it's right. I think in my mind that it's always, it's always putting the act of, of, of the home and the caretaker in this punitive position, which for me, again, is always about economy, right? This is like low paid, underpaid work, not paid work um, of of like being the person at home taking care of of something right so so in my experience right I'm a caretaker I've been a caretaker forever like a nanny a babysitter now I'm a mom and I've been at, worked with in colleges for like 15 years it's it's that act of kind of being beside some someone as they're developing and changing and that work is seen as the story of that work is seen as somehow suspect i don't know what to say about that i haven't figured it out and i haven't come into contact with a way of thinking about it that feels really good to me <laughs> it just always seems as though this work of women and the work of caretakers is always, you know, it's, all, yeah, you, you all know what I'm talking about, maybe. Um, so anyways, this, this was another version I did that was directly speaking about this idea of like time, the passing of time through this idea of like the caretaker. Um, so there's this kid and there's these various women figures and then there's this other person taking off a shirt again um, that's repeated over and over and over again. And this installation that is on the, let's see, it's on the, the I don't know, it's your right hand side, um, is, was installed in this gallery for a, a show at Derek Ellert Gallery in New York last June for the show that Nancy Shaver did. It was a solo show for this woman, Nancy Shaver, who I collaborate with and was one of my teachers at Bard. Um, and, and we were talking about this idea of this piece then being put literally in the background, right? So things are actually hung or installed on top of it, therefore making it more invisible, right? Which I thought was, for me, was really, really exciting. This idea of a, an, an object that's like um, not asserting its art, its capital A artness, right? As though, as though it's like untouchable, but it's this idea in my mind of art being something that is, is most interesting for me when the line of its authority or its value is, is confused, right? That if you pay attention to it, maybe it can do something or it has some kind of rigor, but it allows you or invites you to have your humanity be with it somehow. Um, so again, this is like why the strategy of the home and quoting the home and the domestic is so interesting because in, in quoting it, it, it is this immediate way for people to kind of 
be familiar with how to be around it, um, almost as a kind of theatrical trickery. Uh, and so, I mean, I don't, and I don't know what more to say about that as a kind of manip manipulative thing, right? Where you're trying to pull people in, um, in, in order to acknowledge their belonging or acknowledge their own history or something. We'll talk about that later. Um, and at this point, I wanted to acknowledge two things that have been really, really important to me. The first is Nest Magazine, which had a very short life, but a very rich life. And Nest Magazine was the only, um, interior, the only magazine about interiors that, that really did an extremely good job of, of fulfilling um, a dialogue about interiors um, as, a, as, a psycho, as a psychological place, as an art place, as a, like an anthropological, uh, a cultural anthropological um, place of evidence, right? So designers is a place of creating evidence about how we are and what we want, and then the actual homes of people, right? And so for me, what it did was it, it created the first dialogue that, that put something like Liberace's home in the same in the same critical context as like a hoarder. So it's looking at these two things as like beautiful and horrific, right? And 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 and, and rich of evidence of something, right? And then they would invite really pretty great writers and photographers to come and do investigations of spaces. So check that out. And uh, and then the other thing is IKEA. Right, IKEA, and maybe maybe places like Muji, um, but more so IKEA because IKEA is dealing with furniture, which is like a sculptural thing, as a as as also an, a kind of in between place, as close I understand to a, a a a store that becomes like a museum where people understand, or they have enough clues to understand that they belong to a, a really well-designed thing that's made pretty inexpensively or a funky thing, right? Like a yellow desk or a, like a crazy file cabinet with like wacky knobs. That, that there's a kind of, it's cueing people in to not be anxious about how much they know or don't know when they come into a place. And I was very, very, I'm very, very interested in what that set of clues are or what those um, cues, I should say, and, and, and how this, again, kind of getting back to the arcade, this experience of a kind of dictated wandering and wondering about who you are and what your life could be like, right? At a relatively affordable price. And, and how that is not how people enter galleries. And that's not how people enter museums. That, that, that when we go to a museum or a gallery, at least for myself, I'm going there to at best examine, I'm, at best I'm looking at the evidence of the thinking about other people. Um, and at best I'm, I'm going there asking for them to solve my problems. And at, and at worst, I'm, I'm, I'm just like a tiny, or maybe this is a good thing too, but like a kind of like tiny nothing that's, 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 being, that's, be, that's like being invited to, to participate in an academic hierarchy in which I may or may not be thought of. And, and I don't mean to put myself in like the center of this. I just mean that the the way that a kind of academy kind of bolsters its own authority um, sometimes and a lot of times, I mean, at least at this point, has really alienated a, a, a broad public from understanding that the way that the way that you can look at art or that that the act of looking at art, right, the behavior of looking at art and making sense and, and, and counting when you're in relationship with it is for everyone. This is to say the act of 
looking at a thing that's different than you and, and saying, who are you and who am I, right? And who are we together? Which is what looking at art generally is. So in kind of the, the institutional construction of kind of like the authority of like, look at all these weird things that these weird people who are smarter than you are doing, right? Um, are, are doing, like, don't you feel dumb, right? Don't you feel confused? Don't you feel angry? Uh, <laughs> and then, and then, and then the whole act of even getting to the like, wait, who, who are you? Like what, who are you and what am I? And who are we together is somehow like that whole conversation is, you know, missed. But in Ikea, <laughs> in an Ikea, it's very, very clear, right? <laughs> so as I'm, as I'm, and all of this is totally predicated on the idea that like, I'm a full-time teacher. I had a, I had a, a baby who was like in a closet with another student when I was teaching, right? I have no time. I'm totally exploited. Um, I don't sell any of my work. I, I decided early on that I was going to divorce myself from the gallery system so that my thinking never had to be, well, I have terrible boundaries, right? So that I would never get my, my thinking confused with the economic security of my gallerist, right? Or for myself, right? I was just always going to work very, very hard in order to have liberty, right? With what I made. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I've got questions about that too. Uh, so I, so I'm at home, like I'm teaching, and then I'm with a kid, and so all I can do is really slow down my observations of the home because it's the thing that's around me. It's the best research thing that I have, um, and I made these kind of small sculptural things which I called holders. <laughs> and the, the, they were these kind of forms that, that were mimicking roughly kind of like a mantle clock, but they had space to like fill them. And, and I was interested in kind of figuring out this way to kind of chart my own behavior of things in relation to each other in the home. And this kind of, kind of recording, um, the, the physical evidence of value versus like who I really am, right? The, the, the actions of daily life, which is just like panicked and hysteric, right? Like all the time, like, ah, oh, where are my keys? Where's my cell phone? Like, where are my pants, right? Like in my house, because my life, I'm always spread so thin and have so little bandwidth. My house is a record of that of that behavior. So I was interested in kind of creating these, these spaces, right? So on the, the place over my sink, there's like this, right? This thing is holding, all the other detritus is coming up and then just documenting as an almost research practice, like how things sit, how things sit in relation to each other when I'm not thinking versus when I'm being very, very um, specific. So for example, like there's like some things that are kind of sticking out more than others because I needed to be reminded to like cash this check or right, like these, this is how you make pie um, uh, or like pay this person or here's the map of the zoo that you're always forgetting, right? So that kind of the hierarchy of things that I need to remember being like this almost like Physi this physical, it's like a, like a, it was a trash can, right? It's like on view for everybody and it's three dimensional and you can walk around it. And, um, and I just thought this was like amazing. This was, this is just the best. Um, and, but it was, it was, it was good for me. It was interesting for me because it was, res it was kind of recording everyday life while also being this kind of fixed mobile unit, right? That could, that could move from my home to a gallery and still retain the homeness, right? In the gallery. But it changes in the gallery. Stupid galleries. Um, so, and this is, so from there I started inventing these, 
inventing right all by myself these sculptures <laughs> that were that that were more interested in creating the uh, a void right much like the holder where a, a thing was a thing could be imagined in it Right, so the opposite of Ikea, where you're looking and you're thinking like, how can I take these things and put them in my home? This was like a thing that went in the home wherein the absence within the structures themselves could be imagined as offhandedly like a, a place to like put something or display something or forget something. And, and, and also I was tracking this difference between living with these things in my house and then, and then observing what they did in the gallery, because I was really, really interested in that. How, how um, untouchable things are once they enter an institutional space, which is hilarious because then when we did, we were offering the show at the Henry, I'm like, I'm not interested in the Henry. Like, I'm interested in people's houses. Whatever, I'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert. Okay, so. So um, the other thing that I was noticing as I was, I was building these um, was that this, this idea of them in, in mimicking the body or um, a posture of some sort was, was very important to me, that they were mimicking the kind of emotional conditions of the, the, the life of the home somehow. And also I started recognizing that they had this like almost like comical sense of of um holding things that they were like displaying and holding things and that in this way they were a lot like women <laughs> right that that they were these kind of almost like invisible structures to just put shit um and this might be a bridge too far but it really it really struck me as as like a fascinating, a fascinating thing to kind of work on a sculpture and really think about it critically in terms of like, is it doing as much as it can do as I walk around it, right? Is, does the thing that I know from the behind, it, it different than the thing from the side and from the front? So I'm thinking about these, right? In a, like a very, very like, you know, old, old fashioned way in terms of sculpture, um, modernist way, uh, if I'm gonna be honest, um, in terms of the value system of like what a singular object can do, like oh, and then and then how I'm also being like yeah, but it's also just like a, t a side table in your in your in your um, in your entryway that's meant to become invisible. It's meant to become this thing that just collects your change and your bills and you know and and that that idea of something that's like valued and aspired to, and then also made to become invisible, that tension is quite quite interesting to me in, in relation to this thing I was talking about before, the, the act of caretakers. Like, oh, teachers, they're so amazing. Oh, they, we need them so badly. What they do is so amazing. They should get a billion dollars a year, right? And then what? Then I'm like standing at the food bank, like watching two elderly women like fight over onions. It's right. This is this this like strange, this strange sense of like being so so valued mythically over here, and then just like so uh, ignored right over here. So then Buster Keaton, right? <laughs> so Buster Keaton being in this position, Buster Keaton, the actor and filmmaker of these comedy films. Um, being this like perfect position of like a deadpan, right? Where chaos abounds and his reaction to it is there's no language, there's only the body and there's only the face in order to say multitudes, right? Um, so with the, the image too of this kind of like, the kind of the ways that jokes can be told using scale, right? So there's also this idea of like, here's a tiny man with a large rock and here's a big man with a tiny rock. These are very, um, to me, and these in this couple, like leaning on each other, right? In this like embrace, right? That's like totally precarious. I'm like, you know, I'm married. I'm like, yeah, that's about right. 
that's like we're fo- close, very close, and also very far away, right? And this this physical relationship as a way of kind of mimicking the interior life, but the the, the sensations, right, of of what it is to be alive, um, and the ways that that comedy. <sighs> We all, yeah, we all know comedy, but that that comedy, but I'm going to, because I'm talking, I'm going to say what I think about comedy, <laughs> right? That, that, that comedy and the jokes, even these kind of like small jokes, like the lean, right? Or the, this like flop, right? Are this way that we are almost like, that we're, for myself, that I am flipping power structures, right? That comedy offers a threshold to um, have an injustice, that there's an injustice, but, but it's going to create this back door where liberty is attainable through flipping the system, right? Through, through, through acknowledging the injustice, but inventing another way out, right? So good. Um, and, and that, that in, in Buster Keaton, in my mind, that this is an example of like a physical gesture um, through the face and through the body, always cre- like reacting to the reality of the circumstances and then creating some sort of liberation um, and some sort of possibility when the situation could not be worse, right? And, and this seems like a very powerful and exciting thing um, at this time, just as a human being, not even as an artist, but just as a human being. Like, how do I, how do I, like, like a, in a co- comedic situation, how do I step, I'm like inside the, the like horror of the situation, but how do I step outside of it in order, or beside it, in order to flip it or change it somehow? You guys tell me, I don't know. So here, here he is, and then here I am um, in this, these really great, squ- they're like squash courts at Seattle University that I discovered that there's these like white boxes, so beautiful. So I was like, this is the perfect place to like stage a dance. So I had a friend come with me. I just took this like very flat, this like flat, thin board, painted it black. And I imagine myself, uh, <laughs> so artists are the worst. I imagine myself <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a person. <laughs> what would that be like? <laughs> I imagine myself in the circumstances, in the worst circumstances of my lived everyday life, and then try to make that into a piece of furniture using my body and, and a board. <laughs> this is why I didn't win the Genius Award. <laughs> I was so serious when I was doing this, and then I would laugh about how serious I'm like, can I be like an armoire? Like, <laughs> like, and then I was like, you know, like when you have to think of a lot of ideas, but you're like, all I can think of is like, like bedside table. I can't even think of like a piece of furniture. <laughs> so, so it, and, and it was allowing like my body to be my body, like my weight to be my weight, um, like my hair to like be part of that, that, that visual form and material as well. Um, and, and from that, those exercises and the experience of those exercises was, were then changed. So, so, so I'm like, so I'm like doing the thing and then I'm looking at the photos and I'm, I'm trying to understand what where is this going, right? And so then I, then because I have like a little bit more dexterity or inventiveness with like paint and pencils, then start using 
using those connections or using like a kind of physical weight or precarity that I understood in my body and 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 some verbs to and interpret the interpret I I then interpreted them within the set of like many 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 drawings, um, and those are weird, right? And they're very small. So photos very helpful for me iteratively when I'm trying to understand something. And drawing is very important to me iteratively. And the combination of them too, the kind of freedom that it allows me because they're both very, very fast. And then when it's done, that I can look at them and understand them um, as evidence and understand and like, like kind of evidence of like a way of understanding something is also very, very important to me. Now, is this art? I don't know, right? It, to me, it's more like evidence. And like this, this is also like a research and evidence, but it can, I mean, this could also be art. <laughs> and then, so then I'm like building up. So I'm starting with my body, then I'm doing my drawings and then like a genius, right? Then I'm moving to actual material and thinking in my scale and making these, these, these drawings basically with cardboard. So riffing on some, some things that I've done in my research or things that I've observed and then translating them into these kind of like two scale um, objects where what's very important to me is like precarity, sagginess, like instability, but how do you get that? Um, uh, how you how you get that in a in an object like this, or the objects that I've been showing you, is this material called aqua resin, which is a non-toxic resin, and a fiberglass. So I can take this chair, or even this, right, which looks basically like a pinata or a paper mache, but it's so strong because of this resin and fiberglass material. It has the precarity that I'm interested in and the untrustability that I'm interested in, but it also has the strength to like hold all of my weight. So that's very exciting to me materially, that you can look at these objects that I'm making and trust them right, as believable um, or props at, maybe, um, or you cannot. There's like that kind of like, mm, this kind of suspicion or distance in my mind about them, right? So they are, they're like possibilities. So here's a collection of them in this, sh this show that I did called Showroom, which was the precursor, this was the test ground for this exhibition, um, um, which is at the Henry right now. So, so because you all know that I'm like obsessed with objects, right? I also, I wanted everything to be empty, but I wanted this idea about the, 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 those aspirational choosing collection, like, like arranging to be hinted at somewhere in this exhibition. So I did these drawings of just like very common vase, you know, a vessel shapes, and then made these like very strange, like creepy tacks. Um, and that these were all hung at a kind of display height um, and that were very light. So they were almost like these kind of ghost possibilities for what could be positioned or placed on these objects. But the objects could also stay like, like these kind of stoic, uninhabited, um, like forms. Dun, dun, dun. And here's fun and fun. How much time? Like ten, ten, like five minutes? Ten minutes? Okay. Um, fun no fun is the exhibition that is at the Henry. And you, most of you, I guess we'll be we'll be going. Yeah. Okay. So um, fun no fun is like. Oh my gosh. The Henry asked Kraft Dunst, I don't even know how to start this story, other than to say that we, myself and, and Dan Webb, who's part of Kraft Dunst, had done, had done this show at the Greg Cusera Gallery at, in Seattle. And, and because it was about everyday life, I was like, we, there's no way to do the show in the Greg Cusera Gallery without changing the space because the Greg Cusera Gallery is like this like cathedral 
to money. <laughs> and it's a great cathedral to like money. But I wanted, I wanted to invite uh, our friend um, Dave Leip, who's an architect, to come in and, and, and figure out a strategy for like, basically like castrating the space, right? And, and so, and he did that really, really beautifully. And um, hims himself and Dan Webb and, and Matt Sellers, Dan and Matt are both artists and, and Dave is an architect, did a really phenomenal job of kind of solving that problem. They were then asked to the Henry uh, to come up with a solution to this very large basketball court <laughs> that they have in the gallery that's a very confusing space um, because what what can go in this space um, it's very it's 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 yeah you'll go you'll see so it, it took about six months of us so because they were invited and because I was kind of the brains of the operation, um, they also invited me too. And at the time I'm like, well, I'm not, I've got my own problems. I'm sculpting my own things. Like I will join in this, um, but I'm much more interested in Brechtian theater right now, <laughs> which we haven't talked about, uh, <laughs> and playwriting, which is this other thing that I do. Um, because it's something you can do pretty easily as a parent. Um, so <laughs> no shaft to playwriters. My plays are terrible. Um, so I was interested in them building a set in which I then like wrote a thing and cast and like did something really big for myself that that would be, and, and the work, not for myself, always for the work, um, that, that that would be really exciting. And what they came up with, because because of the things that they belong to were this kind of like really like architectural rigor, 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 rigor. And, and, and it, it lacked the thing that I was avoiding, which was like the like, oh no. <laughs> and, 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 a, a few, and a few months into the iterative process of figuring out what we were going to do, it became like very um, clear that that I was the oh no, <laughs> that I was the kind of like t tumorous, like seething, like leakage, right? Um, <sighs> the like lady, the hysterical lady sculptor, right? Which is not a, <laughs> whatever, it's true, it's true. <laughs> so, so, so the work, right, that was done for showroom, which was like a previously scheduled thing, all now, in addition to more sculptures, had to occupy this space and create like chaos, right? So it had to best mimic all of that stuff I was talking about, like the gum and the band-aids and the earplugs and the like car insurance card that's like seven years expired, like all together, right? So that so that the, the, the rigor of everything else could take you through time and create neutral spaces. And that this was almost like a saturated space of, of like the invitation of belonging. Um, when I still don't know how I feel about it, I think that it's crazy, right? We, and I think that there is liberation there, but, but it also, it's also strange seeing your work that you were, like by, by virtue of the collaboration, which is something I do quite a, a lot, again, out of kind of self-preservation, it's just easier to work with other people sometimes. It's that act of like taking something that you think is perfect and diluting it for the good of the, of the, of the whole. And so when it comes to like feeling like really good or really proud, it's difficult because you're like the good and the pride is in is in um it really is in the confusion and the like interpersonal growth rather than the like me performing like myself like the best I can like looking as good as I can and I think that for me is where the payoff of being an artist really is right that's the most exciting part it has to do with this idea in my mind of 
of kind of growth as a human being, right? And this is a job that allows for you to maybe sometimes look good, but more fruitfully um, be comfortable looking bad or like looking bad isn't so bad. It's being misunderstood, right? That's the part that really is hard. Um, and to grow more at ease with being misunderstood or to kind of grow the other areas of your life where you know you're understood so that you can be misunderstood within this. Because I think, I don't know, I just have this feeling that we need more people who are demonstrating uh, kind of looking bad gracefully or something, right? Or with joy, maybe it's just joy. Um, having joy in the face of kind of unknowing, right? Which again is a kind of like power flip, like comedy is. Um, so in that way, I'm so extremely proud of the show. Um, and I wish I could be with you as you looked at it. Maybe I could, because I it it, does in my mind have more to do with like what people bring to like moving through this space right and how they experience it more than the authority of the thing right like going and looking at the thing and it telling you something about how smart the artist is this was made I think with much more intention for the ex our experience in 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 the gloriousness of going into a museum and looking and wandering and wondering. Um, but that's, that's a tough thing to position. I mean, it's a tough thing because you have to know it in order to know it and not everybody knows it. So it's, it's interesting how the show is being kind of received. Kids love it. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's a good thing. So I'm just gonna show you some so there's like this thing that's built in. I don't want to spoil it. I'm going to spoil it a little, but it changes when your body's in there. And this is this kind of space that we built up in one of these, like, these rooms where it's the hottest space. It's so bad. It's like these kind of attic spaces. So, okay, so I'm going to stop there to give some time for questions. It's a, it's a funny, it's a good place to stop. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so again, no boundaries. There's n <sighs> Okay, this is crazy. Are you an artist if you're outside the economic sphere? Like, am I an artist if I'm not making a living from what I do? Mm, what defines, uh, what defines what? Uh, <laughs> I guess it's a good, it's a good, Evergreen is a very good place to ask, like, like, what are you doing? Uh, okay, so if I'm following the question, um, which is blowing my mind, because um, I'm unpacking it as you ask it, um, Okay, so the simplest way I know to answer it is that like there is problematically no separation between myself, my daily life, my life as a mother, and the studio. Out of self-preservation, I have had to understand fights about like what <laughs> like unpaid internet bills with my husband as as places to understand like the sensation of a certain thing and then in and then and then take that as as like a form we have had fights where i've had to ask him to draw it out as a form in order for me to understand what he's talking about sometimes because at times language is like the worst in relation to like 
communicating as where a form or a shape or a texture can be very, very clear. So, so I, this is not, I feel like this isn't answering your question uh, other than to say that everything can be art, right? But it's the, it's the rigor, it's the rigor of how you frame it all because like me fighting about the internet, right? Or whatever with my husband, or like how we look like the trashy house in the neighborhood because we don't have time. That is not art, but it is research and the research goes into the art. So in that, in that way, it's all studio. I mean, I've had to, in order to not wanna kill myself, right? I've had to embed the domestic into the work um, in a way that's really painful uh, because it, it's such a direct address of like my value as like a woman and as a mother, and now I'm gonna start crying because it's just such a shitty feeling, right? Um, but that's also, for me, very good to have something in a kind of visceral, like visceral way at stake somewhere in the work, but not be the point of the work, right? Because then that is not good work, I don't think. To have it embed as a embedded as attention is very good to be informed of that experience, but then it's not stepping beside it in order to kind of like do the job of art. Right, which is to kind of expand ways to think about it. I'm not answering your question, I'm just talking more. Mm, I'm so sorry. Does anyone else want to ask me a question? <laughs> well, and I think this is the thing about my bias toward observation, right, as, as that, uh, that, that through observation and standing beside things and learning how to stand beside them and, and, and learning how to kind of create space in polemic situations um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a radical tool, right, for kind of undoing um, tension. Uh, at the same time, that tension is really necessary in making things that like do something. So, but I think I think you're yeah you're you're right that 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 like observation and that looking is like a really formative tool. And I'm and I feel it too. And I'm and and I think. You know, I'm guileless enough to like, like say, you know, um, okay, what do I want to say about this? Okay, there's something also that I'm not saying, which has to do with like experiencing um, violence, right? And experiencing... Um, being made to be invisible by, um, by another person in a way that makes you not a person. Um, and it's an experience that I'm gonna assume that a lot of people have had in this room in one way or another and, it, and it, it, it's a defining experience or set of sensations that if understood as a threshold to understanding, right, of getting beside an experience, of understanding that you are not nothing, right, that you aren't um, whatever the worst thing you think about yourself that the experience has made you believe is true, that that ability of, of, of looking into the, the face of your worst nightmare and understanding that it is not true um, can create a liberty, right, and in that way, like a, a freedom, let's just say it's like a freedom 
and an, an ownership over um, yourself that I equate to joy, right? And so comedy is a way of doing that. Um, but the comedy oh, like has to understand the com like in my mind, the comedy always has to understand that evil is in the world and that it is not the thing that defines us, right? But it's, it is, it's not nothing and that, that this is so, it's so stupid, but it's that, it, that love, that love um, makes and, and, oh my gosh, I'm wanting, ugh, that like, love and hope of the possibility of something um, like good and loving disarms um, terror. But that's very confusing to do and it's very hard to do and it's like there's a lot of work that has to be done in order to make, construct a joke or a thing or make work. Um, because it because the joke can also be a deflection, right? It can be also just be this kind of like offhanded one-liner that is like a nothing, right? But there's something about it, uh, the things that you're talking about, it, like has to both m like accept the conditions and and love the conditions in order to have the freedom to kind of upturn the conditions, right? You can't just create another polarity and be like, I'm not a mom. Like, I didn't spend half an hour, right, this morning, like, fighting with my son over, like, putting on pants, right, so that I could take him to school so another woman could look after him, right, where I pay all the money that I make in order to, like, pay her a really good wage. Like, all of that tension, right, has to be, it has to, in my mind, like, there's an embrace. But I understand that I can even say that because I had the resources to go get therapy, right? Which is a privilege. And that I had a support system in a community around me that I know inherently like look after me in a, in, a, in a really specific way. And I think that it's very hard if you don't have that community around you to, it, oh, and that community has a privilege to then kind of go in and do all of this work of like flipping and flipping and flipping. So I understand that as like part of my privilege. And the issue of, of whiteness too, which is like a great, which is like, uh, like the most delightful topic right now because I'm like, uh, you know, thinking about performing my own whiteness as a kind of like, oh, excuse me, oh, hello, I didn't see you there. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? Like that this, or the defensiveness, or the like, all of all of this 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 examination of, of privilege has been really fascinating. Uh, you know, as a fascinating life's work because then you're just kind of like examining everything that you feel defensive about, and then incentivizing everything that you feel defensive about, so that you can just be more like open, right? And that there's more space for other people in in my mind. But we're just like walking around like, oh. Every, I, I mean, it's like if you go to a foreign country and you see these Americans and they're just like taking up so much space and then I'm making fun of them for how much space they take up. And then I look at the performance of myself and I'm like, oh my God, me too. I'm like that too. It's the worst. It's hard. Like, like where they go. Where they go or what would you put on them? And what, thing? okay. So, yeah, the, I mean, it's interesting because in this, the show with the Henry is going to be over in September and I live in a very tiny house <laughs> and there's a lot of furniture that I've made. And so I've started thinking really strategically about what, what the, the life of these things, what they, I really meant them to be and what I want them to do. And, and, and the, be, like I, I, you know, like I know what I would do with that, what I would do with them in my house, which is that they would just like be a surface, like every other surface. Uh, and so I'm like very clear about what my, my shit is that I would put on them. And, and I think that I'm, I'm much more interested in, what they what 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 happens to them in in other 
in other places. So a dentist's office, like a child care facility, a, a private home, like an elderly person's home, an el a retirement center, a, a women's clinic, right? Like what, what, what other people would do with them just as, as, as possible displays, right? Like do they carry brochures? Do socks get folded and like shoved up on there? Um, there's like, it's a, I don't know if it's like very egotistical of me like, first of all, to think that anyone would want to live with them or be with them. Um, but I'm really interested in, in what, what the lives of other people do to an, do to an object, you know? And, and I, you know, like, I can't even fantasize what I would put on them. So for the, the next life of this project, I've started, um, I started kind of compiling a list of where I want things to live and then just do another photo documentation of like how these things exist within that mediated experience of like the photo too and the iterative process of the photo. Um, but then I don't, you know, like I don't know if that's important. I don't know what I'm going to discover from that. Um, I don't know if it's worth doing. But I'm just, I'm curious about what would happen. And so maybe that's the, that's the thing. It's kind of like vessels of curiosity. Like, because we know what happens to a painting. And we know what happens to like a strict sculpture, right? But, but this idea of like this in-between thing where it's like a sculpture, dot, 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 is like, I don't, I don't know. And, and is that design? Am I a designer? Did I just become a furniture designer? Maybe. Ugh. It's funny that you brought up American Apparel too, because when that like that first started, which I think is now bankrupt now, I don't even think they exist. I was really excited because it was like a prison uniform in a bunch of different shapes and colors. Um, and cuts initially, and I was like, this is my brand. I'm gonna do this forever. I don't even care what those photos look like. Because it, it meant that like bodies became the thing, like the clothes became invisible and the bodies became the thing. It's interesting that you brought that up too, because that has, in my mind, like a kind of physical. Anyways, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I, I guess, are, are you asking, and I'm really trying to, I'm trying to understand the question. Yeah, but it's, it's like, it, it's like, okay, so, so, so think about like this, that Ikea is mass producing garbage, right? And that all of antiquity, right, if we go to the Met, like all of the stuff that we value was all like garbage to another civilization and the things that we understand in art, art history, like from the way, 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 way back are all garbage. Um, and so it's that understanding that, that, that there's something about art history's relationship to the material of everyday life um, being somehow really important to under, like understanding how like time and history and historical context and, and, and people's desires change values. And that my, my curiosity as an artist is that I always get to, like the comedian, right? I always get to like stand outside of the market, especially me, because I'm not, I'm like really not any, any market. I'm like, the, the. <laughs> uh, so my, my observations and the evidence of those observations are, are, are kind of all, like in my mind, kind of quoting that or hinting at the, this, I, this, 
well, it's hinting a lot at just like ideas, right? Because I'm not working at marble. I'm not working in bronze. I'm working in cardboard and fiberglass, right? So, so I think fr from that standpoint, just kind of concept conceptually that that there's a that a kind of quickness is really important to me in order to comment so whether it's drawing or photography or like writing a play or whatever the kind of the ways that I can use a form to stand beside or confuse a topic or there's this really horrible term in wine the wine world where they talk about like the terroir which is like all of the stuff and the dirt that like all the seasons and the whatever that make up the flavor. But it's, it's, it, it, and I think that kind of, that, that like literary, the literary in my mind, cause like it's always about books and like that you like are packing so much in to a sentence where there's like all of this tension and all of this other history and past that, that a lot of people are coming from that kind of come into a response. Um, but I think the thing that is different about, <laughs> the thing that's different about what I'm doing is that I get to be a tourist to like everything. I get to be like a terrible historian and a terrible designer and like, you know, that, that I don't have, I don't have to answer, um, I don't have the same set of critical responsibilities as people who are really designers like have to, which is like the thing has to the thing has to perform something for X amount of years or something. So, I mean, it would be in more of those kind of like fringe lines of design, I guess, where it just becomes like, like exper like more like art, right? Where it gets a little con confusing. But I think there's something about, at least in my mind, being the artist that gets to not dabble, but really let the spine of the question dictate what the material outcome is gonna be. Um, and for for right now, it, it it is it is this like interest in form and object and and choice and arrangement that lends itself more to this at least at this time. But I don't know. Maybe I'll open up a store, right? Maybe <laughs> as another kind of another kind of answer. Good. All right. Oh my gosh! Thank you. Thank you.